Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Fellow Nigerians, for too long we have believed the lie that we are not one people. For too long we have settled for less than what we could become and what we could do if we knew who we truly are. For too long we have been divided against one another. And because we are divided, we have been weak against our common enemies. Common enemies like poverty and corruption, disease and unemployment, violence and insecurity. Common enemies that will crumble under the power of a united people if we could tear down the walls of division and come together as one people, as one nation, in one spirit of brotherhood. <laughs> I am a Nigerian, and I speak of a nation on whom is hinged the destiny of an entire continent, and for whose rise to greatness the whole world is waiting. This is our story, and this is our dream. It's about the Nigerian dream, the Nigerian spirit, and the Nigerian in you. <laughs> Thousands of years ago, men and women began to take migratory steps to various portions of the Earth's surface. They journeyed in groups defined by race, language, and other ethnic and cultural distinctions. Each group sought for and naturally gravitated to that specific destination within the vastness of the Earth's surface, whose version of nature's symphony was in harmony with the call of destiny in the hearts of its people. That area whose geographical features resonated with the people's aspirations and gave meaning to their search for protection, for provision, for peace, for purpose, for glory, and for God. For the habitations of nations were predetermined from the beginning. So while the Caucasians migrated westwards and the Orientals settled eastwards, the Negroes found home around the equator on a continent that had comparatively closer acquaintance with the heat of the sun, Africa. Among the Negroes were certain groups, each a tribe with a unique tongue. These tribes, each in its own time, and each with a peculiar story, found the end of their journey, the embodiment of their dreams and aspirations, the fruit of their search for rest, and a place called home in an area beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, away from the waters of the Nile, the area around the Niger. <laughs> A land of rivers and streams, mountains and hills, valleys and plains, with desert sands on one end and ocean sands on the other, and grasslands and forests in between. A land of grazing cattle and swarming fish, of singing birds and roaring beasts. A land of crude and of awe, of rocky grounds and fertile plains, with soils to nurture a vast array of crops, cereals and legumes, spices and tubers, trees and shrubs, from groundnut to kola nut and from pepe to plantain, from yam and cocoa yam to cocoa and coconut, from millet and guinea corn to rubber and oil palm, a land where two great rivers meet and flow together into the sea. Stories of these peoples have been passed down from generation to generation as sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters sat by moonlight around fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers who told stories once handed down by their forebears. Stories of men on assignment to begin the human race. Stories and legends of princes arriving from the Middle East to establish and organize societies. Stories of he heroes killing vicious serpents, marrying queens, and fathering city-states in multiples of seven tales of a lost tribe of Israel, relatives of the Hebrews, and so on. These stories were mere myths, but they reflected the faith of these people in the interrelatedness of humanity and in the idea that all humans share a common origin, a truth that is concretized in what today constitutes the two main religious creeds of these peoples, Christianity and Islam, meaning that at some point in history, all the tribes that settled in the Niger area share a common ancestor and are indeed brothers and sisters in spite of language and tribal differences. As studies in history and linguistics consequently confirm, 
These people include the Kanuri, who settled northeast of the Niger, and the houses, as well as the Fulanese, who spread east to west across the north of the Niger. They include the Igbos, who settled southeast, and the Yorubas, who dominated the southwest. In the southernmost end, they include the Edo's, Urobo, Ishekiri, Efik, Ibibio, Ijo, Ilaje, and others. In the central region, they include the Jukuns, the Nupi, Tiv, Idoma, Igala, and others. These, together with over 250 other ethno-linguistic groups, found home in the area around the Niger. Though differing in tribes and tongues, these groups had significant elements in common. They shared certain values, such as the belief in the supreme being, a high regard for integrity and honesty, loyalty and community spirit, chastity and morality, diligence in commerce, industry, and agriculture, aversion to subservience and oppression, resistance to tyranny, and a penchant for conquest and dominion. Across various centuries, the history of these groups boasts of the likes of Mai Idris Aluma of Bornu, credited with victories in 330 wars and over 1,000 battles. Queen Amina of Zaria, the legendary female warrior and state builder. Uthman Danfodio, who spearheaded the Fulani Jihad, which in its true essence was a fight against oppression. Soide, the founder of the Nupe Kingdom, and the first Etsu Nupe, the first king of the Nupes. Oramiyon, the Yoruba and Benin legend, son of Odudua, founder of the old Oyo Empire. Li Shabi, the heroic liberator of the Egbaz. Eware Ozolua, a CJ, and the other empire building kings of the ancient Benin Empire, reputed for leading their armies to battle in person. Eze Akuma, the first king of Aruchuku, and the young and brave warriors of Igbo land, ingeniously depicted in Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart in the character Okonkwo. These and many others across the centuries were indeed a people terrible and victorious from their beginning. These groups interacted with one another, and in the process, they shared culture and language forms. They interacted with one another mostly through trade and sometimes through wars. In some cases, they also shared and transferred bloodlines through intermarriage. Now, they existed in a compact such that most of these groups that inhabited the Niger area related more with one another than with groups and territories outside the region. These were signs that pointed to the destined union. But that union had to be facilitated. And so the Europeans became the facilitators. When the Europeans gathered in Berlin in 1884 to partition Africa, the invisible hand of the creator ensured that all of these tribes were apportioned to one steward, the British, and that none was left aside. And so the British came to colonize the area. They were met with resistance from our fathers, the likes of Caliph Atahiru of Sokoto, Obakushoko of Lagos, Obauvoranwe of Benin, and King Jaja of Obobo. Our fathers resisted gallantly, but the colonists prevailed because a divine agenda was in process and a great destiny was being shaped. <laughs> Thereafter, the creator sent the wind of amalgamation and began to bring these different groups together until 1914, when the Northern Protectorate and the Southern Protectorate were amalgamated to form the framework of the destined Nigerian nation. The colonists thought it necessary for economic gains, but the creator had his eyes set on the great nation that was to emerge. Thereafter, the union was subjected to tutelage under colonial rule. But when the period of tutelage drew to a close, the nationalistic spirit was teared up in the hearts of our heroes past, the likes of Habad Makoli, Nnamdi Azikiwe, Obafemi Awolowo, Amadu Belo, Tafawa Balewa, Anthony Nahoro, and others who became arrowheads in the battle for independence. And then at last in 1960, the independent Nigerian state was born through the selfless labors of our founding fathers. When the founding fathers of our nation, Nigeria, 
spearheaded the course of our independence from colonialism and the consequent socioeconomic and political subjugation. They had a dream of a great nation built upon the foundation of equality and justice and established upon the pillars of integrity, honesty, hard work, and selfless service. One nation bound together under God in freedom, peace, and unity. A land whose peoples, though from different tribes and tongues, will stand together in the spirit of brotherhood to build a great nation where no one will be oppressed and where peace and justice will reign. These fathers dreamed of a land where no man would face the humiliation of the inability to cater for his household, where no woman would be forced to resort to prostitution or begging to make ends meet, where no child would be denied the right to education or be shamefully sent to the streets to beg or hawk because of poverty. A land of opportunity where young and skillful men and women will be provided the platform to labor with a sense of dignity and in the process not only earn for themselves and their families a comfortable living, but also build the economy of our nation to great and towering heights. These ideals of our founding fathers were expressed in creeds written into our founding documents, composed into the lyrics of our founding anthem, reenacted in the pledge by subsequent generations to be faithful, loyal, and honest, to serve Nigeria with all our strength, to defend her unity and uphold her honor and glory. Even when at the beginning our fathers doubted the essence of a Nigerian nation, they never ceased to believe that the destiny of the African continent is intertwined with the destiny of the Nigerian state and that Nigeria is destined to lead Africa to our essence and greatness. And so they labored to build a great nation of which posterity will be proud. Nationalism, nationalism, patriotism, unity, tolerance, these were the ideals preached by our founding fathers. Dr. Unamdi Azikiwe said in 1960, as a young man I saw visions, visions of Nigeria becoming a great country in the emerging continent of Africa, visions of Nigeria offering freedom to those in bondage and securing the democratic way of life to those who had been lured under an illusion, into an illusion of security under colonial rule. I trust that I should dream my dreams amid the peace and ever-increasing prosperity of the people of my native Nigeria. The motto of the Independent Nigerian Federation, the Independent Federation of Nigeria, is unity and faith. May we guard our unity and keep our faith. Those were the words of Dr. Onandi Azikiwe. Sabu Bakatafawa Balewa, inspired by the success of the American nation, said, in less than 200 years, this great country, America, was welded together by people of so many different backgrounds. They built a mighty nation and had forgotten where they came from and who their ancestors were. They had pride in only one thing, the American citizenship. I am a changed man from today. Until now, I never really believed Nigeria could be one united country. But if the Americans could do it, so can we. Sama Dubelo taking a firm stand for tolerance, one said, here in the northern Nigeria, we have people of many different races, tribes, and religions who are knit together to common history, common interests, and common ideas. The things that unite us are stronger than the things that divide us. I always remind people of our firmly rooted policy of religious tolerance. We have no intention of favoring one religion at the expense of another. Subject to the overriding need to preserve law and order, it is our determination that everyone should have absolute liberty to practice his belief according to the dictates of his conscience. Perhaps the most romantic articulation of the Nigerian dream was done by Chief Obafemi Awolo in his poetic piece, Duty to Nigeria. In his words, it is a duty that we owe to our great dear motherland, to enhance her and to boost her in the eyes of all the world. Egalitarianism is our national watchword. Equality of good fortune shall be to each sure reward. Liberty and brotherhood are the goods for which we strive, plus progress, plus plenty, and all the good things of life. Up, up Nigeria, and take thy rightful place. It is thy birthright and thy destiny, Africa's leading light to be.
But decades later, decades later, the quality of our nationhood is a far cry from the ideals of our founding fathers. Decades later, lines of division run through the fabrics of our nationhood and cracks of disunity threaten the foundation of our national existence. Decades later, we still have a long way to go from the amalgamation to the making of a great nation. And because we are divided, we have been overrun by common enemies. Common enemies like poverty and corruption, disease and unemployment, insecurity and violence, low life expectancy and falling standards of education. Common enemies that have grown stronger over the years because we have deployed our weaponry against one another rather than against them. Beginning in the days of our founding fathers, with politicians stirring up ethnic sentiments to attract votes from their own regions, to the events that culminated in a civil war that threatened to tear our nation apart. The question then is still the question now. Where is our sense of nationhood? Where is our sense of nationhood? When Yoruba and Hausa neighbors treat each other with mutual suspicion and both of them do not trust the Igbo man next door, who in turn has created stereotypes for all Yorubas and Hausas from the errors and imperfections of just two people. Where is our sense of nationhood? When as public officials, our portfolios and offices are staffed mainly by people of our tribes, so that we appoint people not necessarily because they are competent, but because they are our kith and kin. Where is our sense of nationhood? When we celebrate corruption and defend the corrupt, insofar as the corporate is our kinsman or kinswoman, where is our sense of nationhood? When our places of worship, even in cosmopolitan areas, are determined or at least affected by the tribe of the clergyman in charge, so that there are Yoruba churches and Igbo churches and Kalaba churches, while Hausa and Yoruba Muslims who pray together in the same mosque have been known to rise up against one another during inter-ethnic clashes, where is our sense of nationhood? When during football matches, a mistake by a Garba or a Keita becomes an opportunity for some of us Igbo and Yoruba fans to deride the Abokis in quotes, who we think only found their way to the team through the quota system, while we see a mistake by an Obina or an Obafemi as what it is, the mistake of just one player. Where is our sense of nationhood? When we won't allow our son Kelechi marry a Bukola, nor would we give our daughter Amina in marriage to a Chinedu simply because of tribal differences. Where is our sense of nationhood? When non-interest banking has become a reason for us to engage in a religious war of words, while the economic merits are left undebated and undiscussed, where is our sense of nationhood? When our political decisions are based not on merit but on ethnic and religious sentiments, such that a Chukuka will not vote for an Abubakar, but would rather cast his vote for a Dikinemeka, even if Abubakar is more competent. I will not mind snatching ballot boxes for Dikinemeka, while a Musa will not vote for a Maduka, but would rather chase him away with stones when it comes to campaign in Sokoto. Where is our sense of nationhood? When we create a dichotomy between indigen and settler, and put a limit to the prospects of the so-called settler, such that a woman who has worked all her life in Jigawa State as a teacher cannot be promoted beyond a certain level. When a man who was born in Kano and has lived all his life in Kano, not just in Sabongeri, but in the heart of Kano, and has embraced the culture and language of the people, cannot become governor of Kano State even if he's competent, simply because his name is Namdi. And when a man who grew up in Onisha and has lived all his life in Anambra State cannot even dream of becoming a local government councillor in Anambra State, even if he's qualified to be a governor, simply because his name is Adamu or Adeife, where is our sense of nationhood? When people are killed, property destroyed, and a whole village raised to the ground in the name of indigenous settler conflict. Where is our sense of nationhood? When innocent men, women, and children are maimed, hacked to death, or burnt alive simply because they belong to the other tribe, the other political party, or the other religion. Where is our sense of nationhood? Even if we lack a sense of nationhood, 
Even if we fail to see that we are one people, even if we fail to see that we are one great nation, where is our sense of common humanity? Where is our sense of brotherhood? Where is our conscience? That milk of human kindness. When armed men would rob, rape, and plunder, and ask their victims to lie face down on express ways to be run over by moving vehicles, where is our sense of humanity? When militants and extremists would destroy lives and property through carnage and bomb blast, where is our sense of humanity? Where is our sense of nationhood? Why have we failed to embrace the words of our founding fathers, the likes of Sir Ahmadu Bello, who preached tolerance? Where is our sense of nationhood? We have failed to unite because we do not know who we really are. We have failed to come together because we have lightly esteemed the things that unite us. We have failed to embrace the spirit of nationhood because we do not appreciate the essence of our common history, the greatness of our common destiny, and the mysteries of our common geography. We have failed to unite because we have failed to read between the lines. If we could only read between the lines, we would uncover mysteries that pertain to our nationhood. It is no coincidence that this nation is situated in the area around the River Niger. It is no coincidence that this nation derives its name from the River Niger. It is no coincidence that this nation is the meeting point of two great rivers before their waters flow into the ocean. It is no coincidence that the densest and one of the most diverse populations on the continent of Africa converge around two great rivers. Not around the Nile, not around the rivers of Ethiopia, not around the Zambezi, not around the Congo, but around the Niger and the Benue. It is no coincidence. Even if it were just coincidence, like a great patriot said, coincidence is just God's way of remaining anonymous. <laughs> and like a sage also said, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search it out. The invisible purposes of the creator are discernible in the visible creation so that we can discern wisdom lessons from nature. Instead of our conflicts and bickerings and fightings and quarrelings over our nationhood, what the creator would have us do is ask the simple question, why? If we take a look at the map of our nation, Nigeria, at the two rivers, Niger and Benue, that meet at a confluence in Lokoja before their waters flow into the ocean, what we would see is the letter Y formed by the meeting of these two rivers. We have it as an inscription on the shield in our coat of arms, but we never ask why. Sometimes we hang it on the walls of our offices, our schools and public places, but we never ask why. Sometimes we place it on the middle of our flag, the green, white, green, but we never ask why. If only we asked why. Explorers have said that the river Niger is one of the most mysterious rivers on the face of the earth. If only we, we asked why, we would find that in its features are hidden depth of meaning that give clues, figurative clues, to the essence of our nationhood. The Niger has one of the most unusual roots of a major river. It has a source in the Futajalon Highlands in Guinea, barely 150 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. Normally, it would have simply flowed into the ocean from there, but it doesn't do so. Instead, it runs away unusually from the Atlantic Ocean and runs into the Sahara Desert, and then makes a sharp right turn in Mali and travels southwards through the northern border of Benin Republic into Nigeria. Then it integrates with the Benue and flows southwards through the Niger Delta into the Atlantic Ocean, traveling over 2,500 miles in the process and forming the letter Y within the Nigerian map, as if the creator threw up a puzzle and challenged Nigerians to find out why. If only we asked why. We would see that like the Niger travels the distance across nations to integrate with the Benue, so it is that over the years we have migrated across ethnic lines, settled across ethnic lines, married across ethnic lines, born children across ethnic lines, and have become not just neighbors, but family. If only we asked why. We would see that like the Niger and the Benue traveling from the west and the east,
to meet at the center before their waters flow into the ocean. So Western civilization from Christianity and Mid-Eastern civilization from Islam can come together to forge one great nation that will impact the whole world represented by the ocean. If only we ask why. We would see the role of a heterogeneous Nigerian nation in a conflict-torn world in desperate search for unity and peace in the midst of diverse interests. If only we asked why, we would see that like the, like the Atlantic Ocean received the integrated waters of the Niger and the Benue, so the world is waiting to receive solutions and lessons from a united Nigerian nation. Solutions to terrorism and religious extremism. Lessons in tolerance and unity in diversity. If only we asked why, we would understand why it was that neither the jihadists in the 19th century nor the colonists in the 20th century could impose a religion on the entire Niger area. If only we asked why. We would understand that the unusual route taken by the river Niger teaches us that greatness can only come through going through the full course and lasting the distance, indicating that cutting corners through corruption and mediocrity are alien to the true Nigerian spirit. If only we asked why. We would see that the Niger and the Benue have enriched humanity, supplying food, water, transportation, and energy, teaching us that greatness for us as a nation will only come through service to humanity, service to one another, servant leadership. If only we asked why. We would see that and understand that the river Niger flows into the Atlantic Ocean, not through Guinea where it began, nor through Benin Republic, but only through Nigeria because this nation is destined to impact the whole world and to lead other African countries to global greatness. If only we ask why, we would understand our great destiny. For us to fulfill that great destiny, for our nation to fulfill that destiny, our motherland is searching for leaders. Leaders in various facets of life. Leaders who possess the true Nigerian spirit, a spirit of tolerance and integrity, transparency and accountability, probity and selfless service. Men and women who will lead this nation to greatness. Men and women who, like our forefathers, will lead the people to battle. The battle against poverty, the battle against corruption, the battle against disease, the battle against unemployment, the battle against violence, the battle against underdevelopment, the battle against falling standards of education. <laughs> Detribalized leaders who will fan the embers of nationhood and keep alight the flames of unity against the winds of nepotism and tribalism. Parents, fathers and mothers who will model before their children the qualities of tolerance, unity and loyalty. Teachers who will become to their children, to their pupils, an example in patriotism and selfless service and who will explain to the younger generation the essence of our common history, the greatness of our common destiny and the mysteries of our common geography. <laughs> Men and women in politics, in civil service, in the corporate world, in business, in sports, in entertainment, who will become the models of the Nigerian dream and the embodiment of the truth that greatness and success in life can be achieved without compromise of values. Religious leaders who will use religion as a tool to weld us together and not as a wedge to divide us and whose lives will become the signpost to the land of our dreams, a land of truth and a land of justice, a land of unity and a land of faith, a land of peace and a land of progress, a great nation where no one is oppressed and where peace and justice <laughs> are reign. On the shoulders of patriots, I took a gaze into the land of our dreams. On the wings of patriotism and faith, I took a mind trip to our dream nation. And I saw that in her was found no place for ethnicity and tribalism. I looked around for nepotism, but there was no one like it. I searched for corruption and disorder, but no one in that land looked like them. I cried out with a loud voice to violence and insecurity to find out if they were there, but no one responded. In that land, an Igbo man can be elected governor of Kano State. 
an Anhauser man can become the democratic governor of Bayelsa State. A Yoruba man can become the governor of Niger State. And a Do man can become the governor of Imo State. And a Bayelsa man, an Ijo man, can become the governor of Katsina State. Because in that land, though tribes and tongues abound, there is only one united Nigeria where the best, the brightest, the fittest, and most competent are given the opportunity to serve irrespective of what part of the country they come from. And there are neither indigents nor settlers, but one people. That is a Nigerian dream. Ours may be a complex family, like a family of stepfathers and stepmothers, stepsons and stepdaughters, with children not all having the same parentage. But I've seen fathers and mothers work together with stepfathers and stepmothers to raise sons and daughters and stepsons and stepdaughters to become great and prosperous in life. If it can be done in the family, then it can be done in the nation. Where the parents in the south will rise up to defend the rights of their majorities in the north to education and the decent life. Because they know that as long as the rights of their majorities are denied, it is the rights of their own children that are being denied. And where the elders of the north will demand environmental justice for the people of the Niger Delta. Because they know that as long as the people of the Niger Delta cannot breathe in fresh air or cultivate their land, it is the rights, their own environmental rights, that are being denied. Again and again, I've seen this heart-melting demonstration of brotherhood across ethnic and religious divides. I see it in the great love between a Yoruba friend of mine and his wife, who is Igbo. I hear it in the shout of Nigerian football fans when a Nigerian player scores a goal and they do not ask where the player comes from and what is his religious belief. I saw it in the generosity of an elderly Muslim woman I met at the University of Lagos, whose motherly kindness gave guidance and assurance to a fresh Christian student who could not find his way around a new environment. I saw it as a core member serving in Jigawa State, as core members from all across the country, north, south, east, and west, came together, bound by Esprit de Corps, as we worked together and played together and ate together and protected the interests of one another, irrespective of ethnic or religious differences. It is what led us beyond those lines of division to deploy our time, energy, and skills in service of the locals, to combat HIV, AIDS, and drug abuse, to initiate community health education projects, and to share our food with our majorities and local children, who in turn were glad to be of help to us in their own little way. It's why core members made sacrifices to teach under difficult circumstances to the extent that Students and pupils became so attached to core members that they did not want us to go after our service year. It's why a politician I met in Hadeja invited me to his house and took me to his room, his bedroom, to discuss ideas that would better the lot of his people, not minding our tribal and religious differences. We may not all be of one tribe. We may not have the same mother tongue. We may not speak the same language. We may not share the same religious beliefs, but we can rise above our differences to build a great and prosperous nation on the foundation of equality and justice, liberty and brotherhood, unity in diversity. That is the Nigerian dream. <laughs> and I say in the words of one of our founding fathers, Sir Buba Katafawa Balewa, if the Americans could do it, so can we. The Americans have built such a system of equal opportunity that an American, the son of a Kenyan, an American of Kenyan descent, is a president of the United States of America today. If the Americans could do it, so can we within the context of our diversity. The Americans have created such a unified system that two brothers from the same parents became governors of different states at the same time, elected not on the basis of state of origin, but on the basis of competence and state of residence. And this has happened twice in the American history. If the Americans could do it, so can we. The Americans have built such a functional federal system where the resources of each state are used for the development of the people who reside in that state. If the Americans could do it, so can we. 
We can build a great nation where leadership is all about service to the people. Where the police truly serve and protect with integrity. And the courts are pinnacles of justice where incorruptible judges dispense justice without fear or favor. A nation where merit is the order of the day. Where creativity and innovation are rewarded. Where enterprise thrives, jobs abound, and poverty is dealt with. A nation where the economy is run on ideas and not on natural resources. And where human capital development is given priority. If the Americans could do it. If United Arab Emirates is doing it. If China is doing it, if Brazil is doing it, if India is doing it, if South Africa is doing it, so can we, even much more, even far better. Yes, we can, and yes, we will, for that is our destiny. But whose responsibility is it to take our nation to the promised land? Once again, if we read between the lines, we would see the letter Y within the map of Nigeria, formed by the two rivers, Niger and Benue, indicating those whose responsibility it is to take our nation to the promised land. It's no one but you, the youth of this nation. As the letter Y begins the words you and youth, so it is that if this nation is to rise to greatness and fulfill her destiny, it begins with you, the youth those who are young in age and full of strength, and those who are young at heart and full of faith. So next time you take a look at the map of Nigeria, and you see the letter Y formed by the two rivers, Niger and Benue, it's not just signifying the essence of our nationhood. It's also saying that it begins with you, the youth of this nation. It begins with you seeing yourself primarily not as an Hausa, Fulani, Yoruba, Igbo, or any of the other tribes, but primarily as a Nigerian, first as a Nigerian. It begins with you seeing yourself not as a Northerner, nor as a Southerner, but as a Nigerian. It begins with you refusing to be sectional in thinking, but national in orientation and global in vision. It begins with you treating your neighbor not based on his ethnicity or religion, but based on our common humanity. It begins with you embracing those values that can help build a great nation. It begins with you refusing to give or take bribes. It begins with you refusing to cheat in examinations. It begins with you saying no to cyber crime and advanced fee fraud and all the things that put us in bad light in the eyes of the world. It begins with you choosing to work and earn rather than rob and plunder. It begins with you choosing the dignity of labor over the indignity of prostitution. It begins with you taking responsibility rather than taking drugs. It begins with you refusing to be used as thugs in political conflict. It begins with you basing your decisions in life not on temporary pleasure, but on permanent principle. It begins with you participating in the governance of our nation, choosing your leaders not based on ethnic or religious sentiments, but based on merit, holding your leaders accountable and demanding good governance from those you have elected. It begins with you offering yourself for service and living a life that qualifies you for leadership and not one that disqualifies you. It begins with you maximizing your potential to build a great nation, excelling in academics, flying high in your profession, becoming innovative and enterprising. It begins with you unleashing the Nigerian spirit within you. And what, you may ask, is the Nigerian spirit? It's what makes us the wonder of the world. It's expressed in the newness of spirit and the never give up attitude of our football teams that can bounce them back to victory from four goals down. It's seen in the inspired works of our Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winning literary geniuses and in the creativity of our fashion and movie industries. It's expressed in the generosity of our philanthropists and in the energy, the passion and the swagger of our musical artists. It's expressed in the resourcefulness of the Nigerian woman 
who in spite of difficulties, somehow manages resources creatively to ensure that her family never goes to bed hungry. <laughs> it's seen in the intelligence of our professors, the inventiveness of our artisans, and the ingenuity of our scientists and professionals at home and abroad. It's what attracts the whole world to the Nigerian economy in spite of all our challenges. It's expressed in the attractiveness and beauty of the Nigerian woman that once gave her the crown of the most beautiful woman in the world. It's the attractive smile on the face of the average Nigerian that gave him the reputation of the happiest person in the world. A smile that is sustained even in the midst of difficulties by the wits of our comedians who can bring fun and laughter out of our pains and by that unfailing belief that no matter how difficult it is today, it can become better. A better day is ahead of us if we can hope for it and pray for it and work for it. That is the Nigerian spirit encoded in the acronym Nigeria for newness, inspiration, generosity, energy, resourcefulness, intelligence, and attractiveness. That is the Nigerian in you. And change begins with you unleashing the Nigerian in you. <laughs> Finally, I am reminded of the words of George Bernard Shaw, that the greatest civilization is going to come from the Negro race, from Africa. I believe this is true. And I believe it's the destiny of the Nigerian nation to spearhead this African greatness. And so I say in the words of our founding fathers, Arise, O motherland, and take thy rightful place. It is thy birthright and thy destiny, Africa's leading light to be. <laughs> Let these words fill every heart and every mouth in every part of our nation. Let it awaken every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. In the north, in the south, in the east, and the west, let Zuma Rock amplify it and let Aso Rock embrace it. Let the rocks of Dutse spread it throughout the north and let Oluma Rock blast it throughout the south. Let it roll and echo on every mountain and every hill. From Mandara Mountain to Joss Plateau and from Udi Hill to Mambila Plateau. Let it flow through the Niger and through the Benue, through every river and through every stream. Let it become a lullaby on the lips of every nursing mother and the words of wisdom from every father to every son. Let it give hope to the student burning the midnight oil, and courage to the youth serving the fatherland. Let it inspire our corporate executives and civil servants laboring to build a great nation. And let it water the fields of our farmers and bring increase to our traders. <laughs> let it give light to leadership from the family to the presidency, and guidance to our judges as they seek to dispense justice. <laughs> Let it inspire our police force as they truly serve and protect with integrity and motivate our military, the pride of our nation. Let it steer our sports teams to victory as they adorn the green, white, green and give pride to our ambassadors, our representatives among the nations. Let Nigerians in the diaspora get ready to come home to build. And let Africa and the world get ready for a new Nigeria. Let it become the lesson of every teacher, the sermon of every preacher, the melody of every singer, and the rhyme of every rapper. Let it roll on in the lyrics of our musical patriots, from Two-Face Idibia to Banky West, from M.I. to Mode 9, from Zaki Aze to Sam Sultan, from Sonny Ade to Victor Waifo, from Oyenka Wenu to Mamanu, Nigeria, and from Asha to T.Y. Bello. In 1914, an African queen was born when the north and the south were amalgamated, and she was named Nigeria. But even though the face of the north and the face of the south became one, it appears that their two hearts never really became one. And so as we approach 2014, when this African queen will be one century old, let two face sing one love song that will cause the two hearts to beat as one. <laughs> and let Banky West steer up the waters of the Niger from the West Bank to the East Bank with the song of one Nigeria. <laughs> let Zaki Aze beam the light of this message from the North End to the South End. And let M.I. and Mode 9 give it rhyme in one line. 
let some sultan once again remind the Nigerians in the diaspora that no matter where they go, they must not forget the Niger area because there is hope for our land. <laughs> let Sonia Day and Victor Waifo tell it in the language of the elders by taking it to the frequency of the higher life. And let Oyen Kaowenu tell of that dream nation once conceived by our founding fathers. Let Mama New Nigeria become a midwife to the birthing of this new nation. And let Asha bring it back to the younger generation by tearing down the generational prison walls so that the young and the old across tribes, creeds, and tongues can come together to retrace those values, to retrace our steps to the land of our dreams. <laughs> and I thought to myself, maybe we have never really cared to ask why, because even though in our coat of arms, the shield with a Y inscription is placed on green vegetation, the reality of the life of the Nigerian is not green. It's not really green, not with poverty and disease, violence, insecurity, common enemies that we must come together to overcome. So let T.Y. Belo lend me a helping hand by bringing the future here and watering our land with our songs of hope until this land becomes the land of our dreams and the banner of our nation rests firmly on a land that is truly green. And every Nigerian will be able to appreciate the why of our nationhood. <laughs> For that is the true meaning of unity. You and I understanding the why of our nationhood. When every Nigerian, every Nigerian from the beach sands of Lagos to the desert sands of Sokoto, from the plains of Meiduguri down to the scenic hills of Calabar, every Nigerian, Hausa and Fulani, Nupe and Igala, Tiv and Jukun, Efik and Ibibio, Edo and Urobo, Every Nigerian will be able to say with certainty that we are one nation and we are one people bound together by one great destiny. Then we will have fulfilled the Nigerian dream and taking giant strides from the amalgamation to the making of a great nation. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria.